Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday I saw SpaceX launching the Amos 17 spacecraft, and this was interestingly enough a free launch. This was to make up for the fact that the Amos 6 spacecraft had been destroyed during an incident related to a static fire of a Falcon 9. You might remember that that explosion was traced to composite overwrap pressure vessels which were immersed in liquid oxygen and allowed solid oxygen to form underneath the overwrap. Anyway, this launch was the third for this particular booster and it would be the last for this booster because unlike most of the launches, this one was not designed for recovery. So after stage separation, this is the last we saw of that ill-fated booster. It has served us well, but it was going to go down into the drink with nothing to stop it. However... SpaceX did have a success to announce in the form of the recovery of one of the fairing halves and finally we got some really good video. This, I pointed out, was a drone which was tracking a ship which was tracking a fairing that was flying under parachutes after falling from space. It's a pretty marvellous uh, bit of video here to be honest. And with successes like this, it's no surprise that other people are really starting to talk up reusability, including Rocket Lab, who held a press conference about an hour before this particular launch. This occurs during a small sats conference, and I don't doubt that people there were rather concerned since SpaceX took the opportunity to announce that they were going to offer uh, flights to space for payloads of 150 kilograms or less for the sum of like two and a half million dollars, which is half of what Rocket Lab is offering. Of course, the drawback is that your satellite has to share a launch with a bunch of other spacecraft all clustered inside the fairing. And, you know, some of them might smell or, as they say in the business, they might outgas, which you, you might think that I'm joking here. But if an, a satellite is outgassing, it can really mess up your sensors. After making a few statements on uh, Rocket Lab's operations and the products that are producing, CEO Peter Beck had an interesting announcement to make. So this is a Rocket Lab cap. Um, this is a cap that I'm about to eat. Um, because I've said publicly a few times uh, the various things that Rocket Lab would never do. Um, so unfortunately, uh, I find myself in the position of eating my hat. So as you've guessed or heard by now, Rocket Lab are planning to reuse their boosters. And of course, to do this, that means they have to recover them first. What they're going to do is in some ways very similar to what SpaceX is doing, but different in other ways. First of all, the boosters aren't planning to relight their engines. That means they are going to come in and decelerate passively. SpaceX's boosters have an entry burn which slows the booster enough so that when they hit the atmosphere they don't suffer huge amounts of problems with re-entry heating. We have seen some very aggressive re-entry heating. This will be significantly worse because there is no chance for this to slow down. They show it uh, deploying a balut, a balloon parachute, and then an actual parachute, and it's actually a parachute with a, a wing, a para wing, so that the thing will be sliding sideways. And using a helicopter, they will then attempt to snag the whole thing and carry the whole booster home. And, you know, this of course seems, oh my god, this is crazy, but actually this has been done several times before. Catching stuff falling under parachutes is a well-understood science. The hard part is getting it slow enough. So we have a we have a, a terminology within Rocket Lab that we affectionately call the wall, um, and the reality is uh, we, we're not doing a propulsive uh, reentry, and you, obviously you saw we're not we're not doing a propulsive landing, and the fundamental reason for that is that that takes a small launch vehicle and turns it into a medium sized launch vehicle. So if you watch the full presentation, Peter really goes in and explains how they have this problem with energy, they have this problem with temperature, and they have this problem with structural loads that are going to have to be handled during deceleration. And these temperatures are high because it's moving fast and the loads have to be high because they have to decelerate quickly enough as it's falling through the atmosphere. They don't have the opportunity to skim through the air. They have to get rid of all this energy and that means high rates of deceleration equivalent to three elephants standing on top of the electron. The electron booster when it's empty without fuel, its mass is measured in hundreds of kilograms. But it is carbon fibre and they can certainly strengthen that tank, strengthen that structure to make it handle the load. The bigger problem that I see 
is the thermodynamics. Simply moving through the atmosphere at that rate is going to produce very uh, high temperatures. And these temperatures will be concentrated in shock fronts where the air velocity changes significantly and there is a huge temperature rise in these regions. The air can be is hot enough that it gets disassociated into uh, ions and that means that it is not only very hot, it is chemically active and it will just cut through materials. Peter actually calls this a plasma knife, which makes it sound like a lightsaber and it's actually pretty close to the truth. So they're going to have to make significant modifications to Electron to make it get through this. So they've been collecting data. The next flight is going to have advanced instrumentation, an instrument unit called Brutus, which will follow the, with the spacecraft all the way down and they will recover it from the ocean after the spacecraft is broken up and splashed down. It's very likely there will be changes to the engine cluster at the back. There will be still nine engines, but they will try to improve its ability to handle heat. These are a set of images. The top is the block five and the bottom is the block three and four Falcon Heavy. And there are changes there just to make it more resistant to the effects of flying through the atmosphere. But almost more important will be changing it so that these shock waves don't impinge on the hull of the booster. The hull is carbon fiber and it's probably less resistant to heat than the engine cluster at the back. One way you do this is by increasing the radius of curvature. That basically means you make it blunter. And the blunter the body, the further out that first shock wave is. And that's where the real heat is. So if you can push that away from the body, it makes it better. So one way to do this is to have an inflatable structure that comes out. And it doesn't necessarily need to protect the engines. It just needs to make the bottom of the rocket wider and flatter. And if they use some sort of inflatable heat shield, they will likely need something at the other end to add passive stability. And we actually did see something that works for this in the video, that is the balut, which in the video it's only there for a couple of seconds, but I imagine that will be there for a large part of the re-entry deceleration. It's very likely that they'll also need some way to reorient the booster before descent. Now SpaceX, you can see they use these reaction control thrusters. Check the booster on the right as it flips around using these little thrusters. Electron will need to do that too. On the other hand, I don't think Electron will need the grid fins because the grid fins are really for active control. SpaceX are trying to aim for a very small target and they need these big fins so that they can control their orientation and their descent. Uh, Rocket Lab, they're going to rely on the landing or the pickup hardware coming to them so they can use an entirely passive stabilization system during their descent. As long as they can get the rocket oriented in the correct direction for descent, they should be fine. But the thing about this recovery mode is that it requires an operational base, a ship out in the middle of the sea. It requires a pilot, it requires infrastructure. and. It's not cheap. That in itself costs money. And if you think about it, the cost of sending a ship, support ships, helicopter out there is probably very similar to what SpaceX will be paying. Granted, SpaceX is recovering bigger rockets. So they probably pay a little bit more, but I wouldn't be surprised if the costs of doing this, of doing the recovery is maybe a, maybe half of what SpaceX pays. So this is where Peter Beck was coming from when he initially said that it wasn't economical to do stage recovery for small launchers. The cost is comparable to recovering a large launcher and yet the cost of the launcher is a fraction of that of a large launch. So it doesn't scale in the same way, but, but Rocket Labs have done the math and they think that it's worthwhile, especially when you look at the number of other small sat launchers and of course SpaceX coming in to steal their lunch. I, I mean launches. Anyway, coming back to the grid fins, just this weekend, China flew a Long March 2C rocket with grid fins attached. Now, obviously, many other rocket companies and organizations are investigating the possibility of recovering boosters. But in the case of China, their initial plans, or what they're announcing, is that they are going to use these to guide the spent boosters to a safer touchdown spot. China launches a lot of hardware over land and the hardware ends up dropping onto land and sometimes hitting things that we would prefer it didn't, especially when you consider that this is powered by or fueled by hypergolic propellants. 
So while this unofficially might be a step towards booster recovery, the official word is that it's just for steering the stages somewhere safe. And now, as a comparison to Rocket Lab with their discussion of re-entry and the wall, this booster is doing exactly that. It's doing a passive re-entry. The flip around had to be forced by the, boot, the uh, grid fins here. There's no RCS, so once the atmosphere grabs this thing, there's a lot of oscillation pushing it around. Look also at the bottom there. You see how the paint is bubbling off? You actually see some red hot areas. This is in daylight and we are seeing areas where there is red, luminescent, incandescent heat. And so these re-entry conditions are likely to be similar to what Rocket Lab is going to experience with their electron booster. And beyond the Chinese government, there are small Chinese startups that are building their own reusable rockets. This is Link Space that have a relatively small rocket that does the hovering thing. And then they dressed it up and a lot of people said, oh my god, China has a SpaceX Falcon 9 clone, but actually it's not that big just yet. Yes, that rocket does look pretty big compared to those people in the background, but that's because it's close and those people are far away. But Blue Origin do have a fairly large recoverable booster in the form of the new Glenn. I'm not sure when we're going to see that fly. Europe has something called the RETALT project, the Retro Propulsion Assisted Landing Technologies. And what they've come up with looks an awful lot like a Falcon 9. Although if you look at the size of the tanks, the propellant tanks, the size ratio shows that this isn't an RP-1 liquid oxygen engine. It could be Hydrolox, it might be Methalox. But I do like the way that the interstage folds out and turns into control surfaces. That's kind of a cool little design feature, if they can make it work. They also have this, which is a single stage to orbit vehicle. Good luck with that. But the truth is, anything that's at the concept stage for an organization like Ariane Space is going to be at least a decade before it flies. But Rocket Lab, they could certainly have this up and running faster, and it will just make it so much harder for any of the other possible small sat launchers to, to compete with Rocket Lab. At this point, if you're not flying and you're a small sat launcher, you're going to have a very hard time taking customers away from Rocket Lab. In fact, I hear that a number of the launches that Rocket Lab are getting are people that have essentially changed their launch provider to Rocket Lab from their existing planned small set developer who has not been able to deliver on time. And I heard Peter Beck explain that it's less about saving money by reusing hardware, more about saving time so that they can deal with the demand that they are anticipating because they don't want to have to scale out their factory, they don't want to add extra extra hardware, extra machines to do this. They just would like to reuse the same hardware so that they can get more launches. But whenever they get this running, or even if they're just trying this, I really hope that they're just very good at sharing these videos with us, because I'd love to see this happening. If you give us some nice video feeds of this, Peter, you don't need to eat your hat. We'll be happy with this instead. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.